pleasure to welcome all of you to uh, on-site OKU's new state-of-the-art professional gallery. And we really look forward to providing all kinds of wonderful, powerful, thought-provoking exhibitions of art, design, and media. And uh, gather them together with us uh, over the weeks and months and years to come. So uh, thank you very much to Cisco and uh, to your staff for all the work to uh, make this opening possible. And uh, as the university, Oakhead University recognizes the importance of providing a learning environment that values indigenous cultural knowledge and fosters inclusivity, diversity, the recognition of First Nations, Métis, and Inuit histories, and their significance to contemporary art, design, and culture. Uh, we're very, very proud of the Indigenous Visual Culture Program. It ensures that students engage in complex and evolving global discourses in Indigenous history, art history, and contemporary practice. And it's very fitting that this first exhibition showcases work representing First Nations, Inuit, and Métis art. So a special thank you to Ryan Rice, the Delaney Chair of Indigenous Visual Culture and creator of Race of Flag, works from the Indigenous Art Collection, 2000 to 2015. This um, gallery was filled with people for six hours yesterday, and I was struck by how important this exhibition is and how much it provides an opportunity to both um, expose this incredible collection which we're going to hear about today, its genesis, the cur curators who made it possible, um, and the work to a larger audience and how over the three months of its exhibition, it will really be able to share this amazing, amazing vision uh, with a broad number of people both from Toronto and beyond. I just wanted to uh, mention that it's supported um, by the Indigenous Art Collection, which is um, a indigenous, <coughs> indigenous and Northern Affairs Canada, uh, courtesy of the Indigenous Art Center, our children's medicine program, and its higher meeting, hiring platform, the Canada Council for the Arts, the City of Toronto for the Toronto Arts Council, and of course the Indigenous Visual Culture Program at Oakhead University, and the Delaney Family Foundation. And Stories uh, from the Ball is also uh, supported uh, by uh, both the uh, Delaney Family Foundation and the Ontario government. Um, it is such a, a fitting dialogue to have today after a spectacular opening, and I, as I know you do, look forward to hearing from this fantastic so Ryan, over to you for a moment. Mark Bruno and Ryan Rice. Uh, I'm the uh, Delaney Chair in Indigenous People Culture. Is this on? Uh, so thank you, Gary, for your opening and welcoming in a good way the works and everyone here today. Uh, Today we're here, uh, welcome to the annual Indigenous Visual Culture Symposium, our seventh one, Stories from the Vault. And I'm excited to host, uh, in conjunction with this symposium and exhibition, Oakhead University's Aboriginal Education Council at the same time. So a number of our council members are here with us today, as well as uh, a number of them are on our panel. You know, we'll soon learn more about who they are in a minute. Uh, so Raise a Flag is a curatorial project proposed to bring attention to the unique and rich national heritage collection that has largely remained unnoticed for its critical contribution by Indigenous artists, curators, and arts administrators. The Indigenous Art Collection, which is now an am am amalgamation of the Inuit and Indian art centers, further, which is a further history to be discussed, celebrated its 50th anniversary in 2016 and remains the only active cultural program withstanding within the federal government. Uh, all others have been transferred over to Heritage Canada. The collection now consists of 4,252 works and speaks to a distinct national legacy of nat uh, cultural production, transition, and survivance that recognizes, supports, and maintains the tenacity of visual culture upheld by generations of indigenous artists across the country. The administration of this collection uh, is significant as well and included a number of folks you will hear from today, as well as others such as managers, Vivian Gray and Leanne Martin, 
Um, curator July from Patsy, who I just learned was down the road. You see her, yeah, the exciting moment down the road. Yeah, not sure. <laughs> and the current staff who supported this exhibition directly, Kevin Gibbs, Rebecca Gillibury, and Katrina Petri. And Kevin are here today. Uh, others who were sig significant to the collection while I was working there was Lori Valcourt, Frank Shabavigan, Heather Campbell, and Valerie DeConte. Valerie DeConte, no one. And there has been many others. Uh, Race of Flag significantly contributes and widens the expanding scope of a Canadian contemporary art history to be inclusive, diverse, and rich. The exhibition, this exhibition, focuses on the last 15 years of acquisitions. So I looked at the years between 2000 and 2015 uh, to emphasize the, the consistency of the acquisition program. Uh, Within the 15-year period, I started with a list of 622 works and narrowed it down to 49 works that you see in this exhibition. Uh, this exhibition re reiterates the collective will that calls upon the federal program's historical responsibility to ensuring the collection endures. I would now like to introduce our moderator and Aboriginal Education Council member, Linda Busani. Linda Grusani Kirigatsi Anishinaabe is a curator and art historian born and raised in Ottawa. She is currently on an Interchange Canada assignment with the Canadian Museum of History as curator of Aboriginal art. Her research focuses on the history of Aboriginal art and artistic expression with an emphasis on contemporary materials. And in keeping with the museum's strategic direction towards developing a collection that better reflects Canada's history and distinctiveness. So I'd like to turn it over to Linda. Thank you, Alder Dahl, for starting us off. Thank you, Alder Sue, for starting us off with those beautiful words this morning. And you're welcome and reminding us of the importance of storytelling. It's an honor for me to be here uh, amongst this group, the small representation of the community, indigenous men and women who have come together to build this collection. And so it's, it's an honor to be here today. We can't hear in the back. Sorry. Is it? <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, the format for today, um, we'll start with a series of, I will start with a, a letter, or, or seven, or six panels. So the format today will be, uh, We'll start with some brief introductions on the panelists, and then I prepare a series of questions to get the discussions going, and then we will open the floor to questions from the audience. To my immediate left is Tom Hill. Tom Hill is a retired curator, writer, art historian, artist, actor, producer, and traditional Piscania singer. He has played an influential role in the development of Aboriginal visual arts in Canada and internationally as the first Aboriginal art curator in Canada. Next to Tom is Rick Hill. Rick Hill has had the fortune to work with Indigenous artists from across North America since 1971. He has been an art curator and essayist since 1974. He was museum director at the Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe, New Mexico from 1990 to 92. Next to Rick is David General. David General is a sculptor, educator, and indigenous arts activist based in Six Nations of the Grand River in Ontario. His very career spans a range of activities, all of which demonstrate his commitment to building his community's identity, health, and prosperity. Next to David is Barry Ace. Barry Ace is a practicing visual artist and currently lives in Ottawa, Canada. He's a mixed he is a band member of the Michigan First Nation Manitou of Highland, Ontario. His mixed media assemblage and textile works explore various aspects of cultural continuity and the confluence of the historical and contemporary. And next to Barry is another Barry, Barry Potter. <laughs> <laughs> he is a contemporary and a photographer in Labrador, and now living in Ottawa, Ontario. <laughs> And last but not least is Ryan Rice. Ryan Rice, Ganganaga, Ganawagi, at Quebec, is the Delaney Chair of Indigenous Social Culture at the Oakhead at Oakhead University. His curatorial career spans over 20 years in museums and galleries. Okay. 
likely need a new introduction. <laughs> so, that's good. so I would just I wanted to get the uh, discussion started by having our panel. Ahab Spence came to me and said, "Why don't you come transfer or not?" You transfer within the department, come and look after this collection, or not just a collection, the whole, <coughs> the whole section. And um, so I did. So I lost until 7 when I left. And your start time would have been in the back of the Indian When I started, I started in 77. I uh, was lucky enough to uh, win a competition and uh, went to work for Tom Hill in June of 77. Uh, and uh, it, it was an amazing year. I tell everybody when they ask about the, the time, I said it was like getting paid to go to school. And um, I had, uh, previous to that, I'd been a, uh, an iron worker, journeyman iron worker. Um, your dad was an iron worker here, noble trade. And um, my mom urged me to become a, a teacher, use my you know, grade 13 education. She was so proud when I became a teacher. And then you know, every day after payday, I had to go borrow money off my mom and dad to buy bread and milk and you know, whatever the household needed. And so I decided to go back to iron work at Christmas one year. And you know, that, that plummeted her faith in me. and. Uh, and not too long after that, uh, I went to work for Tom, and she was back up there. And, <laughs> and, you know, had her there for you know for a little while. Uh, I loved my time at the at the uh, at the department. It was a challenge. Uh, I always believe that bureaucrats are kept on their toes if you make sure that uh, you make friends with the with the important staff like the uh, the. Uh, the janitors and the custodians, and, and you, you want to run roughshod on the uh, on the ADMs and the ministry. Uh, I can say that when, when I left the trade of ironwork, it was punctuated because that day there was a. Um, I worked in a razor game, and we were putting up steel, and they left a couple pieces out, so we put them up, got out of the way. And one got caught when the crane was going up. And the only person on the level where all the fellows were working was a non-native guy. And he was tied up and he couldn't go anywhere. And he got hit by this huge piece of steel. He lived. And you know, we got him out of there. But it was that punctuation was, and don't come in. So, so Barry Um Yeah, I, um, I was uh, studying at, uh, 
well, I was actually teaching at the University of Sudbury Indigenous Studies program, um, and I was doing my master's at uh, Carleton University. And I was researching, uh, my great aunt was a splint ash basket maker, so my research was on uh, Coconauk and uh, splint ash baskets. So I uh, went over and did research at uh, Indigenous Affairs because I knew that they had a very uh, a good collection of cultural arts that primarily came into the collection through NIASH, which was the Indian Arts and Crafts Corporation. When they folded, all that cultural arts ended up uh, absorbing itself into the collection. So. Um, I worked with uh, with that collection, and uh, Vivian Gray was manager then, and uh, Vivian said, well, uh, would you like to curate a s small exhibition on splint ash basketry? Uh, so I said, sure, and I tied it into my um, into my research. So that was kind of, uh, I was given an opportunity to to uh, delve deeper into the, into the collection. And I did a small exhibition that was put on in the gallery that was in the lobby, and uh, that was uh, then toured, uh, because a lot of people came through uh, Indigenous Affairs, a lot of communities came through, so the community from uh, out in West uh, 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 came through and they saw, the, they said, oh, this is great, we do splint ash baskets as well, so can we have that uh, sent out to, uh, to our community? So we did, so they had a short little tour. And uh, then I went back and I, I took to resume my position with the uh, uh, Indigenous Studies program at Laurentian. And then uh, Gilles Henri, who was the uh, collections keeper, retired. And uh, Vivian called me and uh, said that uh, she'd like to bring me back down if I was interested in, because uh, I had worked with Gilles as, uh, as well a little bit when I was there as a summer student. And uh, so uh, she said uh, she could bring me in under an Aboriginal uh, employment program, IRD, you know, the acronym was, do uh, you remember what it was, <laughs> IRRD? Anyway. <laughs> Uh, I, she brought me in under that, and I ended up uh, taking uh, taking the position of managing the collection because Jill had uh, had retired. Uh, so I started uh, with the department in 1994, and uh, from 94 until I had to dig out my uh, I had to dig out my uh, performance review to figure out when <laughs> <laughs> the hell I was there. Uh, 1994 to December of 1999, I was chief curator. And uh, basically, some of the I was responsible for the uh, the management of the collection. My first task was to travel across Canada and go to every regional and district office in the country. I was gone for months, uh, and because it had never really been properly described or our uh, our inventory, and uh, so that's what we did. We, we went through, and it was amazing. The collection survived intact because so many people uh, felt an affinity with the collection. They were very protective of the artwork when it was in their offices. So. Uh, so we, we found the majority of it, and um, then I uh, came back and uh, started uh, working with the uh, with the curating exhibitions in from the collection in the small gallery that we had there. And I worked with curators who were interested in the collection. I remember my very first horrifying experience was that a whole afternoon with Robert Houle and Alex Janvier, who were curating an exhibition for Winnipeg Art Gallery and Jackson Beard, and wanted to see everything that Jackson Beard had done. So it was, uh, you know, I was like so nervous, and that, but it was, it was amazing just to, to listen to those, to uh, Alex and uh, Robert talk about the collection and talk about Jackson, uh, and it was, uh, it was a real learning experience. Um, after I, uh, after uh, 99, December 99, Vivian took a position with Canada Council. Uh, we had established, the department had funded the Aboriginal Arts Secretariat uh, at Canada Council, so she went on a secondment. So I took the uh, acting position as chief uh, of the Indian Inner Arts Center. They just get these damn letters that say, Dear Chief Ace. Can <laughs> 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 I speak to Chief Ace? <laughs> so I think they changed it to director now. <laughs> But uh, yeah, and, and that was a very different role because a lot of people think of the collection, you know, it's the, it's the most important collection of contemporary Canadian Indigenous art in, in the world. It's been built by Indigenous curators, writer, uh, artists, uh, administrators, uh, all, it, 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 it's the most comprehensive collection. Nobody was buying it when, when, when we were buying it, when Tom was there, Rick and David, uh, Vivian. Uh, they built uh, an impressive collection. And you know when they were doing the uh, the seven exhibition at, uh, at the Mackenzie Art Gallery, the only collection they could find all of the artists' work was in the Indigenous Art Collection. No one had Joseph Sanchez in the No, we had Joseph Sanchez. Um, and uh, so, but the the role of the chief was not was very bureaucratic. 
it wasn't uh, like working with a gallery because you had corporate responsibilities, so you were involved with material management, finance committees. It was a, a horrible job, um, <laughs> and you know uh, the and you're always constantly fighting, you know, for the maintenance of the collection. And we'll talk a little bit later about that. That's when we started our artist in residence program, because the department was continually trying to transfer the collection out when I was there. Uh, we worked with Scana. We provided them the funding, uh, thirty-five thousand dollars a year to. To, and we would write the letters for Scanna. I think I was talking to Tanya. We used to write the letters uh, for Scanna to send to the department to threaten them to say that if you transfer that collection out, we're going to. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> and so, you know, here we were. And then, because we knew that when the letter went up to the minister's office, they had no clue what to do with it. So it would work its way back down. And we would write the response to our own. <laughs> So that's kind of how we maintained the collection. Then we, <laughs> and once we, start, once we started the artist in residence program, uh, then the department said, oh my god, you know, they're not just curating these rotating shows out of the ex out of the collection that the bureaucrats don't come to. Anymore. We started bringing new blood in, and then they, it stopped. It stopped. They stopped wanting to transfer the collection out. And they wanted, because it was a photo op for them, they wanted to be down there. And so, Anyway, so that was uh, that was my uh, small stint there. But uh, anyways, uh, I'll pass it on to Gary. Hi, Elizabeth. I'm Gary. I started uh, working with the uh, Inuit Arts Center back in 1998, the Department of Law, and I spent four years at least there. Uh, I came to the department through uh, the software position uh, through Jill Abbasi, the former curator in the department and they hired me on. But just after we were before that, uh, a little bit back on me, I came to Ontario through the military. I was in the military during the short term, short time. Got out, did some work in Ottawa for a while, then I went back to school in Carleton and I had indigenous or I've been it was art history, so this is where I took to be anywhere but not to be in the arts field to say. Uh, but through that process I managed to work uh, with the Inuit Art Foundation for the Summary term got a lot of information and knowledge on Inuit art and history uh, through that process. And then I, I went to the museum uh, in 97, 98 to the trade program. And this is where I met Ryan. And this is kind uh, Ryan Ivo, Ryan Ivo, and about that the art center. But my first job was a uh, research officer. I do a lot of research, I a lot of inquiries, do a lot of uh, hopefully uh, some, some transcribing of. of I do whatever societies and that sort of stuff. So that sort of stuff. Then I branched out into community in 2000, somewhere around there. So that's a little, little bit of where I come from. And the history of Indian art is, is long and, and uh, rich within the department. It goes back to the 50s when uh, James Hughes and others went up north and they started collecting artwork and bringing it down and showed started to really promote Indian art. Uh, not only in Canada but internationally. And I think in about 1970, we wish a data for a show called Human Sculpture. I think it was done with the, the various agencies across uh, Canada. And to travel the, I think, across seas, across the pond as well. And I think that was a very important step in terms of the exhibition of the there. So, um, a little history on that. And uh, I think that's it. So sitting here, I just realized that uh, everyone on this panel, except for Linda, are in the collection as artists. And uh, that's how I came to this uh, understanding what the Indigenous Art Collection, Indian Art Collection was at the time. I came in through the acquisition program. I applied, I sent, I submitted my work, and my work was purchased consistently, probably for four years, or four or five years, and one of the slides just showed one of my works. Uh, I think I was the poster child for two acquisition programs. Uh, indigenous kids. Yeah, indigenous kids. And so my work came in, and then, you know, I, I start becoming aware of what this uh, collection was. I uh, I entered the curatorial field through a collective called Nation to Nation, and. Uh, to get my foot further in the door somehow, I, I decided to uh, do the internship at the Museum of Civilization, which is my Museum of History. And Barry Cottle and I both went through that uh, nine-month program where we learned how to take breaks. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Carried over well. Carried over well, yeah. 
So uh, while we were there, uh, Barry and Ace approached me and asked me if I would come over and work at the center. So I started a uh, five year, I, I, I worked at the Indian Art Center for five years. Uh, I started, I think, as an assistant curator and then I became acting chief curator. Uh, the first assignment I had was actually to curate an exhibition on David General. So that's uh, where I started and uh, how we got, there's, there's the catalog. Um, and, uh, in the five years that I was there, I became, you, for, for, you have to become intimate with this collection. You get to see everything that's out there. I also traveled across the country and visited all the regional offices, did inventory, uh, office decoration, which we'll talk about a little bit further. And uh, so with this exhibition, when I proposed it, I said, I know the collection up to 2002 when I left. So I thought this would give me a good opportunity to learn what was how it continued over the 15 years, looking back 15 years when I wasn't there. So uh, this was uh, a gift to me as well in uh, bringing to everybody. Linda? As uh, Ryan noted in his opening, the center celebrated its 50th anniversary last year. Would, uh, would you like to speak now about the emergence of the collections and how they came to be formed? I'm looking to maybe... Tom or David. Either Tom or David to respond. I'll have the collection to begin. Um, wow. Uh, trying to think of the early days. I, I just want to sort of set uh, an idea of just where I was before I move to the collection. I think one of the reasons I was so, uh, one of the things that I, I did was in 1967, I did a mural for Expo 67, a large exterior mural uh, with a number of artists across Canada. And uh, that was coordinated by the Indian Affairs section. Um, uh, and uh, all of those documents are situated in the archives of that particular work, not my work, but all of the artists' work. And so this, there were little bits of parts of the collection scattered around in different areas. And uh, so when I arrived, there was a big fight going on between the Secretary of State and Indian Affairs. And Indian Affairs wanted to start this collection. And they, the Secretary of State didn't feel that they had the responsibility that we should set apart, that they should do it rather. Um, one of the difficulties that I experienced with Indian Affairs was the discrimination. And I point that out because one of the things, uh, besides them just not wanting Indians to work in their office at that time, um, they particularly didn't like the art that we were producing at the time. And so I had to face a lot of the bureaucrats um, and say, hey, there's nothing wrong with this with us, number one. Nothing wrong with what comes from us. Uh, just look at the painting that's on your wall or whatever. And so it was a real kind of a, uh, I was doing almost a, sometimes a study work. The reason why I mentioned the expo, because at that same time, a number of the artists, particularly one, Cap Alec Jambier, there was George Clutacy, uh, I think at the time we got $300 uh, for doing the large exterior mural. In fact, I think I got less because I used the ceramics, the guy by the name Jean Louis Clouet, who do a ceramic mural from the design guy. And uh, uh, so we were constantly argue, arguing about this. And we thought, okay, this collection, that, or that expo, would formally this whole collection here at Indian Affairs. Well, somehow or rather, that whole collection has not yet been seen. It's disappeared off the face of the earth. 
as far as I'm concerned, they either destroyed it or had someone destroyed or was purchased. And, or, and somehow or other, I felt some of the, the big, large murals would appear in garage sales or something. <laughs> Never did it reappear. But uh, for a while after Expo, I sort of checked out Montreal to see, to see where if it could be found and it could be found. So I imagine they were destroyed. So that was the beginning, but this collection was um, uh, what was beginning to grow, and I thought, well, if that's the case, I'm, and I had the opportunity then to move into, uh, with, I think it was Ahab's beds, and then finally Ahab left, and I took the position to become part of the uh, uh, head of that, the art collection, that I said, this is going to grow and become probably one of the It's going to become, become one of the best collections in, in this in this in Canada. One of the arguments that I had to face at the time there was a whole movement on Victoria Island to create an, an Indigenous art gallery or a center for Indigenous art in Ottawa. And uh, and you cannot imagine the kind of fights that we ran into at that time uh, from the National Gallery primarily because. They um, did not want to have an indigenous cult. They thought everybody should be part of the National Gallery, which at that time we were not, but now we certainly are very much part, part of that, their, their expression of the collection, I think, of the Stellas. I've been there for a while. So, uh, that, so that, early, that early work uh, was, uh, well, was constantly moving from one battle to, to another to survive. And finally, when I left, the, David will remember this, the last day where the, I was told to write the death of the collection. And he wanted me to write this report, and I refused to write it. And um, there was a discussion about acquisitions to the National Gallery, so we put Carl and Bryden in a, in a room with French doors expecting to see Bryden come being, being tossed, you know, through it. Anyway, they had a tremendous discussion. Uh, you know, Bryden told him the process. He introduced Carl to uh, Diane Nimroff, and uh, a number of months went back and forth in discussion, and, uh, well, we know the results of that. So things don't happen by magic. And, you know, what I say about the, the Native artists at the time, everybody played their role. Everybody stood up when the need was, uh, you know, something needed to be done. And, uh, you know, with all that together, uh, we've achieved over the, over the years. I, uh, I went back with the Indian there for a second, because as Ryan mentioned, there was a huge collection within the department of the Indian there, and the five hundred and fifty system, and it was dispersed. And uh, so if you look at the collection when I came to play, it's more of rebuilding that collection. Uh, when I got there, I don't know, it was maybe a couple hundred pieces of gold right now. Yeah, so, and this is where I came to play, and this after this awesome show came with the Curious Bar Ferry and July Pantan. So this is where I came to play. And looking at the whole idea of, of redeveloping and rebuilding that collection, and some of the works that you see here are part of those, those years as well. But, I mean, Native American within, within the department itself has a long history and a lot of long history of, of the voice other than meeting with it. And I think at the time when we were there, we were trying to build that voice, trying to put our, our own new uh, spin on things and whatnot. And uh, I, I, I always judge that, and that's fine. But, I mean, we started, I started looking at things in terms of what can we do, what, we, what can we Neglected, who's out there and uh, who's doing uh, wonderful uh, contemporary art and looking at this and trying to respond to that. And trust me, it's hard to respond because <laughs> this is such a very important I think, uh, exhibition in terms of contemporary eating of art. So uh, that's a little bit on that, I think, uh, in, from where I come from. My, my role as a researcher then, a curator, and, and trying to work with others in our, our section. As I mentioned, it evolved into one center at one point. I don't know what time that time frame was. Um, uh, but we were, it was a separate entity with respect to being there, and they had a huge uh, section in terms of research, uh, 
have building uh, bibliographies, uh, collecting catalogs, division catalogs, and developing a library of Native American Canada and internationally as well. So this is where uh, when I came to into the realm and, and, and working along those lines with respect to to uh, Native American. Um, this one little tale I wanted to tell uh, about the power of art. One of the um, experiences I had while working with that collection was uh, doing research. And of course, I came to Toronto and was looking at different galleries, commercial galleries, and ran into in a Brazilian curator. He ran a commercial gallery here. here and he started talking about a show in Brazil. And I thought, well, that would be interesting. Uh, you know, at that point in time, I don't know if you know the history of Brazil, but there was a, a, a great, a lot of things were going on with the native population and uh, with the Brazilian and the Portuguese people in Brazil. And somehow or rather, it was quite dramatic. I mean, there were literally farmers were going into the jungles of the Amazon basically shooting, telling these people to make land available for farmers. And so uh, then this became almost a, uh, a, uh, a, I became almost obsessed with that, and worried about it, thinking about it. And finally, I came up with this exhibition that was connected to one was called Links to a Tradition. And um, I, it was just it's just a little catalog, much you know, not very big, not not with color in it, just black and white. Packaged it up, sent it to uh, in the first opening. We had two venues. The first show was in Brasilia, and so we packed it all up and it ended up in Brasilia. And I was supposed to go, but I can't recall what, why I did not go. For some reason, I. And other family matters, they couldn't go, and so the collection went down to uh, in Brasilia. And, and when it got there, a guy called me quite certain. The guy with the gallery was so shown quite upset, and he said the collection is all locked up in the warehouse, and they're not planning to open it. And I'm like, oh my God, what's going on? You know? And he says, um, well, I don't know if you know. <laughs> He said, you have to tip the people who, um, who open the doors to allow the collection. <laughs> and I said, well, but we, um, government, I have to you know, go off for a check. And they go, oh, do that, I have to go off for And um, so lucky for me, the guy who owned the gallery was going to be down there. He said, OK, well, I'll see if I can raise the money or whatever they're asking for. And apparently, this is how they got their salary. So all they had to do was just go and lock it and open the door and all the collection would go. So we finally, after a weekend, a weekend delay, it opened and we got the collection up and it, it, it played in, in Brasilia and went on to Sao Paulo after. Uh, but one of the receipts from the newspaper press, or from the, I mean, what we received from the newspapers was the, um, it's the review of, of the exhibition. And here they were all commenting about, look at how we are treating our native people, but what the people in Canada are doing to their native people, how wonderful it is that they're going around glorifying it and saying how great it is. And um, you know that, that it reflects man's uh, culture, and, and all very positive statements. So, you know, in, 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 in the hope that you know, these farmers would put their guns down and, and leave uh, some of these people alone. But, uh, and one reviewer even talked about one of the pieces that uh, made quite an impact in, in that direction. So, it, it, in a way, it had a very positive res response to it. And I thought, well, if anything I did, for <laughs> it's one, it was one show that was a success for my end. Uh, yeah, I just, I just wanted to mention like the, uh, the, the, uh, the collection itself, uh, uh, there is another collection within the collection that's often not spoken about. Um, and that's the uh, Alberta Art Collection. 
Uh, the uh, Indian Arts Center collection stands as its own, but within it is another entity. Uh, back in uh, 1992, uh, there was uh, the Alberta Arts and Crafts Corporation. The way that Indian Affairs uh, funded the National Indian Arts and Crafts Corporation, which is a national organization, which was economic development driven, it was designed to to uh, uh, market and distributed uh, cultural arts throughout the country. Well, after the government pulled the plug on uh, NIAC for obvious reasons, there were a number of issues related to around the misuse of funds, all kinds of stuff that went on there. But anyways, when that plug was pulled, a lot of the provincial organizations started to collapse one after the other, bang, 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 bang. There's only a few left, like Marty Crafts. And, uh, but the Alberta Arts and Crafts uh, Corporation went under. And within that collection, uh, within that corporation, there were uh, what the artists that, uh, that stood up for it uh, stated was the was basically their historical legacy of art, and it was going to go up for public auction. So um, the the uh, there was a lawyer that was hired to uh, to disperse this collection. Uh, a committee organized uh, of artists from Alberta: Joan Cardinal Schubert, Jane Ash Quadra, Kim McLean and uh, George Littlechild. And uh, they advocated uh, to uh, have that collection not sold off to the public. They even went so far as to actually protest. They, uh, they stormed the, uh, the, uh, the auction, and uh, there's a number of newspaper articles that, out, that came out, and uh, they talked about uh, some of the placards they had up there. It was like, you know, uh, death of Indian art, uh, steal our land, steal our children, steal our art. <laughs> um, and so uh, the bidders got really scared. And uh, so uh, Ottawa, the Indian Art Center, had uh, got hold of uh, Albert uh, Orsten, uh, Ostendorf. He was the director of finance in the regional office in Edmonton. And he uh, basically uh, was instructed to go to the auction and outbid everybody, buy that collection. So they went in, we went in and bought the collection for $75,000, the entire collection. There's numbers, they, it's about 250 works of art that are contemporary art, but you'll see 500 because there's boxes of keychains, cultural art stuff came in, but when you look at the entire thing. But in there, you know, was early work by Jane Ash Quatra, you know, the Pemmican Land series, beautiful work that she did with the TV in the landscape. Uh, Joan Cardinal, early George Littlechild, the famous one, you know, she was an Indian princess, she loved to dance, she loved to drink, and then she died. Um, you know, there's this really important work in there, Sam Warrior, um, Ken Swan, you know, there's one called The Wake, it was all these uh, images of, uh, of uh, a funeral on the reserve. Um, and uh, anyway, so it was all shipped to Ottawa. And that's about the time when I started, and we had to inventory the entire collection. So we, we described it, we cataloged it, inventoried it, and had the entire collection framed and stored properly. Um, and there's been agreements through, what I, there were various briefing notes that were done internally, like what to do with this collection. The artists in Alberta were, played a strong role in it, and they wanted the uh, center to maintain the collection. Uh, and it would eventually be transferred back to Alberta at a time when Alberta artists were ready to have it. At that time, there was a vision of a, of a collection of an in, uh, Indian art center where it could be housed. A number of institutions, like the Glenmore, remember, and others, and had sent letters in and said, well, we want the collection, we have the facilities and all that. But they didn't want, the, the advisory committee did not want them to go there. So it still sits there. It sits there. It, it's a bundle within a bundle. You know, Ryan talked about, uh, the, uh, Walter Benet is talking about the collection as a bundle. And it's laid out like this. It can be spoken about. There's another bundle in there, which is the Alberta bundle. Uh, early, early works um, that the artists actually really fought hard for. And I think that's the legacy when you look at the art of the wall. You don't realize the amount of struggle that um, working with that collection as curators or as administrators we had to go through because we were constantly under uh, uh, attack to disperse it or, or get rid of it. So it's just been the tenacity of people to, uh, to maintain that. But again, you know, even at the artist level, you know, Scanna was a very strong advocate for maintaining this collection uh, and the Alberta arts artists as well took the stand for their work. So, 
I just want to talk a little bit about that. I feel that we've been sharing a lot of stories, um, but is there a particular story, event, memory, or experience that you would like to share? And this could be about acquisitions, exhibitions, artists. Is there something that comes to mind? Please start with Ryan. Sure, I mean, there's so many stories, and I mean, five years, uh, we, the three of us, went on a lot of adventures, actually. Uh, <laughs> we turned the center probably with, with the government didn't know what to do with us. We did our own press releases, we did our own catering for the openings, <laughs> we did our own catalogs, we did, we, we wanted the art world to be recognized and seen, so we, we did all this stuff. But uh, one, of, one of the things that when I came in uh, was to work on developing the artist residence program because we wanted uh, the artists uh, have consistently and still consistently talked about today that there's no criticism about their work. The artists aren't getting solo exhibitions. The artists aren't getting exhibitions. So we took the acquisition program, which started in 1990, uh, National Acquisition Program, and we shifted it to be the acquisition exhibition program. So we wanted to give the opportunity for artists to get an exhibition onto their CV, to get a writer to write about their work, and to produce a document that they can carry forward with them to uh, apply for grants, to get other shows, and then through that process, uh, work from, the, from, that, from their exhibitions were acquired. So it started to have a curatorial focus, within those years of the collection. And we worked like crazy, we did 12 exhibitions a year, so we installed <laughs> in two days and we took down in one day and went to the next show the next day. I think Shelly Nero was one of our first artists in uh, probably 1989 uh, that came through that program. Uh, so it was really exciting because we, and the artists were brought in, they were there for the installation, they did an artist talk, we lobbied and networked the whole uh, capital region to get Diana and Emeril was finally coming over. Charlie Other Charlie Hill was coming over. Joe McMaster was coming <laughs> over. <laughs> so we were, people were starting to recognize what we were doing with the center and how we were, and then that, that carried over to the Inuit Art Center, because Barry started curating Inuit Art exhibitions throughout the year, and that led to the acquisitions as well. So it, it was an exciting time within those five years. We are also working on, Barry and I did a travel show called Transitions 2, which took up from the Transitions exhibition. And uh, we were working on a retrospective as well that never, that never happened. Yeah, I think it's looking back, and I don't know if I have any favorite story, I don't have any story about it, but I think it's, it's the, the, the privilege of, of, of meeting and interacting with some, some of the greatest artists in Canada, right? I mean, come on now. <laughs> you know, from a unit perspective, I met David Bloom himself, and I met the Lucy Lightbook, and I met uh, Abraham Henke, and all these wonderful people. So that gave me the, the, the I think, uh, the understanding how important being with artists in Canada, as well as uh, my colleagues here in terms of the shows they put off in the Indian arts and the stations of making and whatnot. So it, that was a privilege. Uh, and it was stressful at times, but it was a lot of fun, as Ryan mentioned. We'd, we'd, we'd be hopping around like crazy, trying to put a show together, doing our own catering and whatnot, like you said, and, 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 and having uh, uh, people come down not only from uh, the employees and kind of grocery and the sound to interact with, with the artists as well, but the, the outside and general public and, and those who come out of the institution. But that was fun. It's quite stressful at times, but a lot, a lot of fun. A lot of laughs. Uh, a lot of uh, camaraderie. I, I would like to add one uh, story about the two of us. Uh, we went into the gallery for our first exhibition to hang. So we were trained at the Museum of Civilization, and we come over to hang an exhibition, and it was the ugliest gallery possible. The lights, the lights looked like disco lights, there was carpeting on the floor, it, it, it just, you know. and, you know, we, we, 
So Barry and I start, we bring the artwork down. We're expected to paint. We look at each other. Who's going to come and paint? <laughs> we're not prepared. We're there. So I guess we're going to paint. So we start to paint, and Barry knocks the paint over. <laughs> and we look at each other like, we're going to get fired. We're going to get fired. I had a quick story about uh, Norval about Morris. So I met him out in 1980, and he uh, told me he uh, just got back from the astral plane, and uh, to, uh, he wanted to let me know there are no Mohawks up there. I told him, I said, I'm a and so, you know, it's, it's a, he's both an artistic hero, but it's also a tragic story what happened to him. So there I am uh, one day at the desk on the 16th floor. His envelope was there. It was from him. He opened it up, and his little Polaroid picture of him standing in a, in a yard surrounded by paintings. And uh, he just said, uh, Mr. Hill, I'd like to sell a piece to the uh, collection. Uh, I have any size and any color that you might want. And I was half tempted, but at the same time, I had so many more was there thinking like, well, we've got to spread the couple dollar amount. But it kind of got to me that this man, who we now all kind of cherish, was kind of living horribly. And uh, we heard all these horror stories. And there were some things in the collection of his, uh, and then some early, uh, was, we had like this, this uh, historic ethnographic thing about uh, more so, and his original uh, uh, collector. Very interesting stuff. So I kind of felt, I don't know what to do with this. I don't know how do you honor somebody like this, but at the same time, you know, he's basically trying to sell, uh, sell a painting just to get some money to go do uh, things that were bringing him down. So I then met uh, Ron Nagana. How many people know Ron Nagana? <laughs> I mean, he was the craziest guy ever met. <laughs> but the most fascinating. And so we became great uh, friends. That's part of it, we became great friends because, you know, if you're round Ron, if you're drinking a 50, you sooner or later. <laughs> uh, we had a party at his house one night, and uh, I began to notice all of these uh, beer cans laying in his driveway. And I said, Ron, you don't even pick up your beer cans? He says, no, the car's coming now, I'm crushing them. And, uh, <laughs> and I don't know, we were all into this kind of thing of saying, our artist warriors of today, you know, are we the, who are we? I don't know, remember, because it's pretty early in the morning. But somehow, this idea came, he was going to make a piece of art from these black beer cans. And I was all for it, especially after Norval. So one day, he goes walking in my office, and then he had this uh, shield. Uh, I think it's in this uh, booklet here, which had uh, one of the longest titles. We didn't even put the whole title in this book. It was too long. The Shield for Modern Warriors. Made with those beer cans, those flat beer cans in his driveway. I think he said that it was also at my concession to bees and feathers in Indian art. Um, but along with that, he made me a little invoice with a miniature version of this with a bottle of tops uh, squeezed into that. But the deal was, Rick, if you buy this shield from me, you get to keep the invoice. Well, how could you pass it up? And I said, yeah, okay, so I did. But I forgot to take it when I left. And so when I saw the installation from the collection, or, uh, exhibit down in uh, the master, they had the shield and the invoice planted for the first time two were back together. But that invoice belongs to me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 just great for <laughs> um, And I see in the cover here a piece of work by uh, Vince Bumbry. This is my Norwell Morrison story. Norvell and a lot of you know prominent artists that showed up at uh, at the Woodlands for a show, and uh, Vince and I are you know, and this guy named Carl picked me up at the airport. He was my chauffeur all the way back to uh, to the island to Birch Island that we were at, and on that evening we went to this uh, exhibition that was being held by the uh, um, not going to get this right. Um, it was the, the art, the art event that they had up on the island there. I can't remember the name of it. 
comes with age, right? If, anyway, um, Carl and I talked about art all the way back. I, I still didn't know his last name. And so we went to this event. We saw all of this, the Woodland School. So we went to this event of Woodland School. We saw all the art there. And then he just comes over and says, uh, do you mind taking a look at my art? So there's this table over there. Every, everything gets rolled out. And we're, you know, we're, I'm traveling with uh, Diana Nimmeroff from the AGO and uh, Elizabeth McLuhan. And we're all just kind of looking at each other. And um, I think I picked the first two pieces. And you would have seen them. There's the one I own right there. What an amazing, to me, that's the most amazing piece of all the ones that, that Carl has done. I'll have to give it to you sometime to, to read the message. <laughs> And uh, so I, I purchased two pieces for the uh, for the gallery. Uh, Glenda Miller purchased a couple for the AGO, and uh, you know, Elizabeth made some just tremendous, tremendous acquisitions for. Uh, I'm not sure who they, she bought them for, but they were part of uh, an, an exhibition that she put on one of the first exhibitions for Carl here in Ontario. The second one story that I have is uh, about Daphne Oakley. Uh, we were having a barbecue at, uh, you know, with a, with a gallery owner and his wife. That we were both in the exhibition, and uh, my wife Mary says, "Of all your paintings, I like this one called the Thunderbird Woman." And I, I agree, it's a tremendous painting. And Daphne looks at her and says, "Have Dave steal it? At least I know where it'll be, and, and it's going to be appreciated." <laughs> so those are, you know, again. We survive as artists by many means of inspiration, and, and a lot of it is friendship. Yeah, a lot of artists have come in and sell, and, and sell work when they come in to visit it, come armed, full of work. I remember Clifford Marable came in one time, and uh, we were in the back, and we brought in a bunch of, she's her own dancer, these beautiful works, and um, so Vivian says, okay, well, we'll, we'll buy this one, and we'll buy this one, and then uh, we don't want these ones. And so, Clifford turns to Valerie and I and goes, well, okay, well, for Indian Affairs, it's 1600 but if you guys want them, they're 500 <laughs> 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 I never liked his work very much. I think 500 is <laughs> I should tell you one quick story, Gerald. Remember this, but like might not have been to it. Uh, we all went over to uh, Amsterdam, Holland, one year. Gerald, oh, okay. myself, uh, uh, Clifford, uh, Robert Hole, uh, Carl Lee, and Tom. Oh, yeah. Uh, we had a great time over there. We, we did everything but talk about art. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, one of the videos, I guess, uh, I don't know, he was in rare form, I guess. You know, he was one of the more loud, obnoxious guys in our bunch. but. Uh, uh, we went to Anne Frank's house, and this was, uh, you know, it was like a pilgrimage. When we go there, and Carl showed up, he painted his face all red, red sacred face, because he was coming there to this thing. But what I didn't realize that there was this French film crew filming everything that we did. In fact, remember when we got off the plane, they there at the airport. I wonder what's going on with this. But, well, we were, I was waiting to see the celebrities get off the plane. <laughs> And uh, they filmed all kinds of things, uh, probably things that we wish weren't on film, but uh, it was a lot of fun. So I think uh, in addition to that, sometimes the greatest discussion about art happens behind the scenes. The stuff that never makes the catalog, never makes it up on the wall, never makes it into the curatorial uh, uh, treatise, because we are also all practicing artists. So by working together, we rejuvenate, or rejuvenate each other, and it was great. Um, Great uh, feeling. I had a lot of, a lot of very fierce discussions about what constitutes real art, and where uh, indigenous art was going, art versus craft, all of that stuff. But at least uh, we had these healthy uh, uh, internal discussions. We never came to any conclusions because then <laughs> somebody else would produce something that would change your whole thinking about the art. So it's it's vitality, the vitality of the personality that I think you made it kind of good. Uh, Tom may have some stories, but discount anything Tom has to say about me in the Netherlands. But if I tell it, it's true. Worse than it is. <laughs> Why did I recall? <laughs> no, it was actually with Clifford and Miracle. Uh, I don't know if you remember, Rick, we were in the lecture hall, and it was 
much like the session where we, there were artists that were talking about their work. And um, when Clifford would stand up and put on this, he'd start talking like an Indian. <laughs> and he'd say, I painted this red, really deep red. <laughs> and then I looked at it again, and I need more red. <laughs> and we'd get and recognize and we'd stop laughing so hard that we couldn't stop. So everybody was wondering if they thought we were sick or something. Yes. <laughs> or if I am standing at the open street. <laughs> That's right, we spent a long time in the Geronimo Cafe. <laughs> and uh, anyway, that was, that was a great time. We did a lot of work. I think it was most worthwhile. At the Louise Institute. Do I remember that place? Clifford would be, he, I don't think he'd be mad if I told this story, because it's Clifford. He met a gal, and they just loved each other to death for every day that we were in Amsterdam. <laughs> and then we were getting on you know, the train to go to Paris. He gets on the train, and we don't find out till we get to Paris that he stuck her with the bill for accommodations for like seven days. <laughs> <laughs> what the hell was Clifford? He just did great. <laughs> no? And of all the guys I could have imagined going through the Louvre with, I went through the Louvre with Clifford. And anything that I wanted to see, we'd go look at it. The Night Watch, the Mona Lisa, whatever I wanted to look at. And he was just the absolute perfect friend in, in letting me see what I wanted to see. But like you know, Rick and Tom have said, that man was an inspiration in his own. His, his humor was contagious and, uh, and it lives in his art. Okay, no more secrets. Let's go back to the question. <laughs> <laughs> I've lost all control. <laughs> um, so this is a two-part question. So during your time with the Center, were you aware that you were contributing to such an important national collection? And also, what piece in the collection holds the most significance for you? And I really want you not to try not to pick your own. Well, mine. <laughs> I'll just comment about it. Ali Gordy, MGM, and uh, uh, it was a triptych, and uh, I believe uh, it was purchased by um, Colin Wasikens or uh, Ahab Spence. I think it's Ahab. Yeah. 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 And uh, the comment was that I was basically concerned with stereotypes of how you need to be in the movies. And, uh, I, and I, it was a, it actually a painting that didn't quite work. I first started it out as a big sort of scope screen. In fact, the title of Allegory the MGM in CinemaScope. And uh, it, I couldn't make, I didn't have the technique enough to carpenter to, to do the curve and make the canvas stretch the canvas <coughs> in it and around. But uh, so that now is in the collection. <laughs> few pieces. I could just call it a triptych. And uh, but there are other pieces that are in the collection that uh, that I thought were significant and were most uh, interesting. I, one of the things that I I remember, well, of course we would call it the Carl Bean piece. piece. And um, the, the whale in the world. Yeah, I can't remember what it's called. Did you, call, did you buy that one, Gary? <coughs> which one? Uh, the Carl Bean piece. Um, which one? Uh, I, what did, I, I don't know. know. Uh, what what year? I can't remember, but it's a big blink. It's the uh, <laughs> world and the, the rocket going up on the side. And there's something about the whale. Oh, yeah, no, that, was, that might have been Vivian. Maybe you might have bought that one. But I always thought that one was the most, one of the most impressive ones, and certainly one of the most. 
ring off the bell for that heavy ring. Like that. Uh, I'm going to just be quick because uh, the piece I remember the most is a uh, print by Jane S. Uh, I was uh, intent on trying to find art that had no direct indigenous content. In other words, it didn't have to have an indigenous symbol or um, story. And this one print that she did, it was, just, it was just beautifully executed. And I thought, we have to get back to the artistry of handling paint and uh, color and shape and focus a little bit less on, uh, on the content. I mean, uh, because uh, nine times out of ten, we have to explain what the artwork means. And so that particular print of hers, I can't remember the title. And then the second one I purchased was one called Up All Night Girl. Yeah. And there was another right. uh, uh, print that she did. And she talked about it, how uh, it was, uh, she went to a protest and people were all up protesting and then you know, start drinking and then this picture of all of these people passed out in the morning. So but together, that polarity of a piece that has absolute just pure color and shape and, and light and then the sound of this heavy duty message, uh, to me that's more representative of where she was coming from. Uh, yeah, we, um, we ended up buying a lot of work uh, from the uh, exhibitions uh, we, that we curated, we had first choice, so we bought from the collection from every exhibition that we, uh, we curated. And uh, the remaining works were offered up to the public to be sold uh, by the artist, and the artist retained 100% of the sales, so we got nothing from it. Uh, and we framed the works as well for the artist that they weren't framed. Um, uh, and it was funny, because this is a side note for talking about favorite work, but I, I remember Jerry Evans uh, exhibited, and uh, he sold, he almost, I think he sold out, sold out the entire show. We bought some for the, for the collection, the rest sold, and, I, and, I, and it was like $15,000 at that time. And I said to Jerry, I said, geez, $15,000, what are you going to do, Jerry? And he was from Newfoundland. He says, uh, oh, he says, uh, I'm going to buy a house. I said, I'm going to buy a house for $15,000. He says, yeah, don't forget. He says, house is cheap in Newfoundland. He says, uh, there's no work there. It's all done. <laughs> but, uh, I guess for me, one of, the, uh, one of the most memorable purchases, I guess, uh, we curated Rosalie Fable in 1999, Longing and Not Belonging, that catalog went around, I think you saw it. Ryan and I co-wrote for that catalog. Um, and it was a really important exhibition because it really um, featured and focused on uh, the artist's source materials. So there were small diptychs and triptychs of uh, family photographs and Polaroids, which come from uh, her family albums. And you know, looking at it, uh, we couldn't even think about just cherry picking this collection of, of this presentation of work because it was so important. And so we bought the entire show. Uh, so there was nothing for sale. <laughs> but you know, looking back now, it was it was such it was such an important uh, acquisition because um, you know you can even see today if you go to the AGO and you see Rosalie's paintings. Uh, some of the you know th those all come from like from that family portraits and Polaroids. Um, at both that time too, we had we had made a really kind of a great connection with global affairs. It's called foreign affairs at the time. And Mark McDowell worked for the uh, trade office in Taipei. And so he had come to the opening and he was really really blown away by Rosalie's work. Really loved it. So. Uh, he says, well, I'm going to be going back to tai Taiwan, and is there any opportunity for us to borrow this uh, exhibition of Rosalie's work? So we said, absolutely. And so not only did they borrow the work, they borrowed Rosalie, because Rosalie ended up going to uh, ta <laughs> Taiwan for, well, she was there so long, they had to send her to Thailand, I think, to, because you can only be in the country for so long, and you come back. Uh, but that was really, that, that was really important at that point, uh, I think, of the program because we were doing such cutting-edge work and presenting such important work that you know people were really starting to pay attention. Uh, but you know, and, and that that was exciting for me because not only did the, the center acquire uh, important work, but it really uh, furthered the artist's opportunity. And I think that's what we wanted to do was not just the financial support, but create these other opportunities that would would emerge out of those exhibitions. So, uh, long enough to walk was a memory. Uh, there's a couple, a couple come to mind. Uh, one was David Rubin. He did a show, and he did it, it was a fish. I remember it was a fish cut sliced up as if he was going to, to uh, have it 
need it, they don't want to have it as a feast. But underneath it, it gets put a mirror on it. And I've never seen anything like that. That's pretty cool. Uh, I think that was a pretty good, it comes to mind, I think, in terms of recognition and, and, and uh, significance of that piece, I think. Also, another artist comes to mind, too, is Shubhanai Shuna. Shubhanai Shuna is from Kate Norsted, or uh, she's still there. Kate Norsted, Kate Norsted. Her work, when I first saw it, the landscape, the work on the landscape in her community was so defined, so detailed, it really, really struck me in, 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 that, in that, I guess, that enormous sense of really knowing, knowing her land, knowing her community and whatnot, and, and the way she executed her work. And if you look at Edo Dark, the first generation, second generation, everywhere, the land, uh, the land I mean, a lot of it is just a boy, really, so nothing really defined. It's just a, a, a space there. So Shivanar to me really put that, that that ownership of land in context really from, from a continued you know, art perspective. I wanted to talk about Mike Massey as well, Mike Massey. Like Mike Massey is really important for me because he really, I think, opened the door for, for some very typically really bad coming out of work in terms of his style, in terms of his, his, his uh, medium and the materials that he uses and incorporates it with and looking at his, his culture, his experiences, and his relationship with his parents, and, and whatnot. So those come to mind as well as one of others. In this one, uh, Ron Naganash, can you title it? Yeah. Does anybody know what time? Yes, that's an awesome piece. When I first saw that, I was just like, whoa, whoa, what is this? I don't know. Never seen anything like that. Uh, up, uh, leading up to that, in, in my own experience. So that's it. There are so many works to, to, to consider uh, because when, at the time when we, when I entered the vault, there were, that was an art history that you didn't get to see in a book, you didn't get to see in person. I was able to go through every shelf, every rack. I can still imagine where some pieces are because I knew where they were, specifically to where they were placed. But when you walk, when you used, you used to be able to walk into Indian Affairs, Indigenous Northern Affairs, and at the minute you walk in, was a huge painting by Norval Morris of Ella Drogen. And that piece is quite outstanding. If, if you get to see it, you would, you would be confronted by an everyday walking into this building that was sort of, you know, not on their side. And there was Morris's piece that just welcomed you. Uh, another artist that I was really uh, drawn to was Glenna Matush, and I ended up doing a solo exhibition of her work at uh, Carleton University Art Gallery. But the piece actually I think about all the time in Toronto because the piece is called My Great Great Grandfather Chief Yellowhead, who was buried under the McDonald's on Young Street. So this piece is, you know, it makes me consider the land, land acknowledgement, who is here, the stories that are here. I walk by McDonald's and I'm like, which one is it? Mm -hmm. Where, which McDonald's on Young Street does this exist? And it's a beautiful piece, and uh, you know, it, I, I I think about this a lot, daily. I'm <laughs> <At> McDonald's. <laughs> Last question that I have uh, to, to pose to these great, great, great people is um, with distance on your slide, uh, what do you envision for the future of the collection? I envision a National Gallery of uh, Indigenous Art mm. with a uh, substantial acreage for a uh, Sculpture garden. And I think you Rick and Tom will remember a place called Kroler Mueller in the uh, in the Netherlands. This was an absolutely gorgeous, gorgeous sculpture garden. I mean it had you know high, high uh, what do you call them, hedges. But anytime you walked up on a piece, you were hoodwinked. You did not know what was around the turn. And just absolutely amazing sculpture by every one of the, the uh, prominent artists at that time and probably for 50 years before. I can't remember the name of the artist, but there was this one piece as large as a ice surface in an arena. 
and it was a piece that you could enter, walk underneath, and crawl up, and you could walk all over the surface. I wish I could remember the name of the piece. You're all the way. Pardon? John Yes. But I can't remember the title of the piece. But it was, but it was all, all white, and the contours were accented with these black lines. Yeah. I mean, um, probably for anybody except the artists of the Northwest Coast, there, there was nothing of that size that, that had been done or still hasn't been done by, uh, by indigenous artists. Uh, so those kinds of earthworks, uh, large scale works are, are something that I, I see uh, indigenous artists meeting. So I'll go back and Rick's, uh, Rick's comments about this, uh, this national gallery. So perhaps we need to think about how do we get the art and the artists to re-engage with the people who get to which it could be the most meaningful, not the curator, not the connoisseur, not the collector, not the bureaucrat, but indigenous youth. So I think we have to find a better way to circulate the collection into our own communities um, and have uh, find a way for the artists to, to re-engage. Now some of them are not doing it, I'm already doing that. But. So I, I, I get worried about taking the best that our people produce and then locking it up in an art prison where they are so inaccessible. And we only get to peek at it every now and then. Uh, we gotta find a better way to help uh, inspire the next generation of artists to not so much to replicate the past, but to see what's gone through. So I also believe helping to understand the history, what took place in the last 50 years, politics, the social change, and all of this stuff, to realize the luxury that this represents but it's also a luxury that didn't, didn't find a home in the community. So I'm trying to reverse that. Yeah. Supplementary manager. Yes. I agree with her. But because of this device, our young people and seven generations are going to have anything they want to see available to them. And who are the better storytellers among <coughs> any of us than the artists who created these works? They can show each works and, and what it means and what it's done for their, their lives and what they see in the future for indigenous people. So I'm still going to argue for the, the, the National Gallery of Indigenous Art, but we need to start using this to have all these exhibitions portable and the artist to be the main storyteller. Yeah, I, th I think the, uh, the collection should, a lot of it should stop being long about as office decoration because it's getting quite old. Um, you know, it's, it's not under ideal conditions, it's under fluorescent lighting. It can be moved in direct sunlight within the offices. So that's a concern over a lot of the historical work. Um, but, you know, I, I, I thought about it and I think, I, you know, there's a number of reports that go back to 1980, even earlier, Jackson Beardy, Robert Poole, uh, Alex, others people have talked about the collection as a study collection. And I really like that aspect because really those are the stories, you know. Uh, I'll go back to what the elder said this morning, you know, those are, those are stories. Every, the, all those works tell our story. That's our, our collective uh, patrimony. And uh, it does need to be accessible to, to our youth. And, um, you know, whether it's used uh, to uh, enhance, uh, you know, an, uh, an indigenous curatorial program to, and, 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 and situate it within an institution whereby we can have access to it um, and share that history because it really needs to be written about, you know, contemporary indigenous art in Canada has never been written in its entirety and this is a very, very important uh, uh, starting point uh, talking about uh, all of the issues that have taken place. I mean, keep looking at Jim's work right there. I mean, there's I don't know more, you know, all of that is captured within this, this massive, uh, it's such a significant collection. So. Having it as a study collection, uh, so those stories and narratives and uh, historical perspectives can be pulled out and contextualized, uh, you know, will not only tell us about where we come from, but it will also provide us with guidance of where we're going in the future. And that narrative is there. Well, for me, I think it's not too far from what Barry said, and also it's, it's to maintain that acquisition of the images are you know, for all of us to see. And, and Colin here mentioned youth as well, have a more involved. I'd be amazed if I didn't mention something a very important organization that's very important with the Indian Americans the Indian Foundation. Although we fund them, they're our friend. They have 30 years of history 
in promoting uh, marketing um, dialogue and marketing and, and bringing forth some of the best arts uh, to the country and the world. But it's also maintaining that connection as well. And we've always had that between the art centers and the foundation, and then we are quarterly. Particular, we've always had that relationship where at times straight, but most part very positive and very, very uh, important. I'd like to see that maintained as well, because it is, it is probably the only one of the you know, uh, publications that kind of devoted to meeting with art, very contemporary with art. And as you see some of the works over here, you can just say, there you go, it's the 30th anniversary. So. Right, so it's very important and to maintain that. But I think the future of the collection, I think, um, is to build upon it. I think. Keep building upon that. And keep promoting it and, and continue that dialogue. I, I think the collection has to be activated significantly, just like an exhibition like this. This is the way that it's going to get out there in public, whether it's in an urban center with the it's on a reserve. It needs to be activated. And I agree with Rick, there are some works that are in there that are horrible. <laughs> the partridge. But it's significant when you look back at it. That's not how you own work, okay? Yeah. Absolutely. I got paid for it though. And I got the, I got the government rate. But really, I mean, when you look, I mean, you look at some of this work, you're like, why was this made at the time? It gives you a sense of what was happening. Poked rugs. You could do a whole exhibition of poked <laughs> rugs from the prairies. It's in Saskatchewan, and there's poked rugs in this collection. But I mean, it, it, that speaks to something. That speaks to something that was happening at the time. It's testament to what was happening. And when we look at these artworks, we see what was happening at that time and how it's carried forward. All these issues that are in here are, are taking place currently today. Tanya Harnett's work about water. Uh, Faye Heavyshield's work about water. These are issues that our community has been dealing with for years and years and years and years. It's at the forefront of contemporary news today, but this is what Indigenous people are dealing with. Reclamation of identity, it's, it's in this collection. Uh, so I think it's really important, and the work has to come from our historians, curators, uh, students who are doing research. This work has to be teased out and pulled the absolute best that comes from this collection and to activate it that way. I mean, you know, working within an educational institution, I'm really interested in how this plays a role in developing our curriculum here. But not only for us, we've developed an uh, education guide, which you can download as a PDF. Uh, we looked at the MAC-10, the Ontario uh, curriculum guide that uh, high school students are getting with art. We wanted to elevate it to a post-secondary study guide, but also to a public study guide. So those are the things that need to be created to activate this collection. Whether it's a hook drug, whether it's that swan, the works are significant to this collection because it tells our story. Mm -hmm. uh, the only comment I had lots of collection slides. The only comment I have to say, and it should continue on into the future. I'm not sure how many people have ever had the catalog or got to see the exhibition with the three today. But the one I mentioned with Gerald, it's called the Shadow of the Sun. That's right, Gerald. I mean, that's probably the most amazing exhibition. You get the combination of, of you know, with art and First Nations art, the Indigenous people. It's an absolutely amazing exhibition, amazing uh, catalog. And I hope sometime in the near future there is another exhibition of the same scale. And I think all the works came from Indian Affairs and and the uh, Museum of Civilization at the time. So it's a, it's a credit to the, uh, the individuals that collected the work and put this exhibition together. Do any of you have questions? <laughs> And there's a walking mic there. Oh, there is? Well, that's the one you have there. Okay. <laughs> it's not walking. It's not walking. <laughs> I meant to cord this. Walking. <laughs> 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 <laugh
segment of our, of our indigenous society that's at peril. And uh, I mean, every community every year has more than their fair share of suicides, of you know, desperation, of hopelessness. And uh, I wish we could follow the example of uh, this place called the Sand. I'm so glad that that was part of the, the trip that Tom took me on, where this community was in you know, social degradation, there was alcoholism, substance abuse, but it was art that turned those people around. They went back and they found their stories, they found their songs, they found their dances, and within a you know, relatively short amount of time, a couple of years, they were presenting all of their arts at the uh, National Arts Center in Ottawa. And the pride that it produced for the master artists that came from that, you know, speaks heartily to the power that art has. And that's, um, I mean, I'll, I'll admit to this, Sometimes you get caught up so much in your own endeavors to, you know, get a new technique, get a new material, get a new place to present your, your artwork, that you sometimes forget about your role with, sometimes your own family, your own community. You know, the heck with worrying about nationhood. You'll get there in time. But you, know, you need to, to uh, you know, take those nearest and dearest to you, the ones you care about. And tell them there's there's no need to despair. There's no need to feel marginalized. You're in control of your life, and nobody can tell you. Uh, this is Gerald. Oh, how are you doing, guys? <laughs> Ladies. Um, one thing I, in the 35 years plus that I've been curating, one of the things that I find is that artists have never been idle. <laughs> You know, they've kept with the times, they've uh, done all sorts of things. And I like kind of what Ryan was getting at at the end, uh, what he was talking about. And I wanted to ask all of you, since each of you are of various generations, and this includes Linda, uh, when you've been there, is how would you characterize, and this is a pure question, by the way, <laughs> how would you characterize the collection and uh, what was happening at the time when you were collecting, when you were either a chief curator or whether you were a manager or whatever your title was, you know, each one of you had, there was something going on at that time. And I hope this is being taped because it's great to hear your stories. It's absolutely amazing. So, starting with Tom. How did you characterize the time you were there? What, the art, what was the big issues? What were the artists talking about? Uh, what was the kind of art being done at the time? Well, I'm, I was there very early, so there were all new ideas were just coming in. But any, it was almost like what, what artists thought art was all about. Uh, I certainly, the effort for any kind of creator, not my personality should not reflect in their art, but sometimes when you're there, it does, and you catch yourself, oh my God, you're, you're causing them to go a certain way or doing something. Um, I think, um, um, well, that's, that's one, that's one, that was basically the main major thought that um, artists, uh, it, was, it was really eclectic, I guess we would say, at that particular point. Everything was being accepted, as you say, from uh, rugs <laughs> to baskets to, not saying that they're not art, they are artistic, uh, out to paintings. And uh, so it was really quite a, I would say I wanted, wanted to, at that point in time, start separating put them into sections, but I never had the opportunity to do that. Well, that's a good, uh, good question because uh, in many ways, uh, Native art or curatorship is uh, time dated to what, what happens in the era. So when I was there in the mid 80s, <coughs> so we realized it's 10 years after Moody Day, uh, 73, all that uh, social activism that took place from there to the 
August to August, not patient BI building. I think that there was uh, people were supercharged about uh, wanting to say something uh, politically, go back to land treaties, uh, language, and uh, all that kind of stuff. But there was also a fierce discussion internally. It was art as a craft, and some some artists wanted to denigrate the uh, crafts as old-fashioned. Others were saying, you know, tradition is the sort of defines us, so we need to build that too. But that polarity, I think, gave us a lot of opportunity to explore what that meant. So one of the first exhibitions I did before Indian Affairs was on this, uh, you know, traditional arts, or whatever we want to call it, because I said, let's not forget that this is stuff that's important. And then I think we had, um, what do you want to say, we had more of an intellectualism that was coming into the art, because uh, we had 15 years of indigenous studies, professors, and scholarship coming out, and so we were better equipped to know how this fits into this other art movement, other minority arts, uh, things going on. Uh, so I think that uh, the dynamics of the time made it very important. Now, when I was there, uh, it was also when I think Pope John Paul II came to Ottawa. And I got to imagine, I sat on 16th floor looking down on this, this massive humanity to see this man. I had a flashback to Woodstock, but I was there, my TV went down. I was thinking, like, this is the opposition to what we're talking about. You know, the Pope said some really kind of freaky things about, about the natives. I guess I was feeling like they're never going to get it. So let's quit trying to appease the power elite, and let's focus on what art means to us. So I think there was a big dialogue going on. Time. Art for art, art sake, art for our sake, or art for the institution's sake. That was, that was a very mutual dialogue. Repeat question. Uh, what I was interested in, David, was the how would you care when the time you were there? You were there in the late seventies. How would you characterize the kind of art you were collecting? And what was the mood at the time? What was happening at that time when you were there? Thank you for the question. Um, for me, it sort of was a period of survival. Uh, because uh, like Tom mentioned, and uh, the art collection was on its way out the door as a, you know, as a practice of what was called decentralization at the time. They were sending all the responsibilities and all the activities down to the regions and in some cases down to the, the band level. And at the same time, there were, there were uh, individual artists and collectives like yourself from the well, Saskatchewan Indian Federal College. Uh, because you were teaching, you were looking for, for more information of the dialogue that was happening between, you know, a little bit that we did have to keep up readings, you know, we made sure we made sure it went to artists. I remember uh, running a check to uh, you and Bob, and when you were leaving for Europe that one time to take some artists there, and uh, we love it. I, I love that being a civil servant, serving you know my fellow my fellow colleagues. And um, but it comes right back to at that time it was it was nothing nothing more than survival. So, I mean, I wish I had some of the glorious, glorious stories that, uh, you know, all, all these gentlemen have at this table. But, you know, I'm, I'm very proud of my contribution. And maybe, maybe it was because I'm Mohawk that uh, I got selected. Right, uh, right Ryan? <laughs> <laughs> or in spite of Or in spite of That coming from a Tuscarora? Or fight words? <laughs> Uh, well, I was I was coming out of the uh, the generation that uh, basically was I guess dealing with the response to 1992. Gerald, you know your exhibition uh, Indigena and the complementary exhibition Landscape Power, um, and I was working with a generation of curators. There weren't that very many. There weren't that many curators at that time of uh, of our generation. Anyways, it was you know. Like uh, Marcia Crosby was working at that time, Lynn Hill was working at that time, um, uh, myself. Um, yeah, so it was, it was a very, uh, Jeff Thomas, 
But you know, we were talking about, I remember distinctly talking about that time, how important those exhibitions were to us and how it re really encouraged us to raise uh, criticality in terms of uh, contemporary Indigenous art. We wanted to, we weren't finding the writings out there that we needed. So we needed, we knew at that point we had to step up the game and that we had to look at the new generation of artists that were out there at that time that were working with new materials and understanding materiality very differently. You know, looking at Michael Belmore, you know, working with copper and Marianne working with salt and, you know, uh, looking at all of this, uh, these, uh, these uh, sort of a confluence, again, between historical and contemporary, kind of what I'm doing now, but they were doing that then too. Um, so, um, and also engaging, engaging um, and trying to develop our own um, lexicon to describe the work. You know, going back and using language, our own language to describe our work. So, and we're still grappling with that today, you know, how do we come up with terms to describe our work? Um, because Western art history terms don't necessarily deal with that. So we knew that we were in, in this domain of wanting to uh, push the community forward. Uh, so the exhibitions that we started to develop started to uh, reflect the art that was happening at that time. And we drew in writers uh, like Audra Simpson wrote for Great Stotts. You know, we started to wanting to develop that community. Um, so um, I think that was that was probably the the impetus was looking at how Scanna um, and the artists that that of that, of that generation, early generation of that, in the late 80s, early 90s, were responding to the, the lack of, um, of representation in uh, academics and within the larger institutions like the National Gallery. Uh, we weren't going to just stand there and protest, but we were going to basically write and curate and present work that was on par with what the National Gallery was doing. So we weren't trying, we weren't banging on the door. We were just doing it. And then they started just to look at these artists and what we were writing and what we were presenting and they're going, you know what, they're doing something, yeah, there's something happening here. So it was kind of different, it, was, it wasn't banging on the door anymore, we just weren't going to wait around. And we did that, you know, with the ACC too, we weren't just going to wait around for people to hire us, we were just going to build our own community, support our own community, so, uh, and just get our own writings out there and get our curators uh, working and, uh, and sharing. So. That, that, that early period when I was there in the 19, uh, early 1990s uh, and into uh, when I left in 2000 was really building that community and looking at those contemporary arts that nobody else was looking at at that time. Nobody was exhibiting Daddy Meyer. Nobody was exhibiting Michael Balmore. Nobody was, you know, there were very few, few uh, opportunities, but we wanted to provide that. So, because we recognized that was the new generation that was coming up and, and they were going to speak and, uh, and uh, push the community forward. Okay. Now, anyways, yeah, I, I, no, I, did, I, I was there for four years, so with about four years, we tried to okay. tried to rebuild the collection based on very contemporary works, very contemporary artists, very contemporary materials, uh, circumstances responding to social, political, and community. Uh, Things going on at the time. Also, there's always with the Inuit, there's always been the voice or lack of voice from Inuit curators and whatnot. There's, a, there's always been that shortage of curators for, for that, within that term. So we tried to focus on that and some of the training programs that was going on at the time, such as the Cultural Industries Training Program and the Museum of Civilizations Training Program. Try to respond to that. We tried to respond to that as well and try and get more Inuit, young Inuit. Uh, uh, scholars and curators involved, uh, such as uh, Heather Campbell and Diane Webster, uh, 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 and now Dr. Eva that was pointing around with Dr. Ruby Murphy and her, her work uh, with respect to curating. So that still continues, it's still a continuation, it's just a, a continuum along those lines. We still always want to see more youth involved in, in the academics and the writing as well as the artists responding in their own words, in their own terminologies, and uh, responding to what's going on in the communities and I think ours overall. I think that's where I was coming from, with respect to trying to add to the collection and to rebuild that collection and 
in the writings uh, amongst them, right? So, and as well as Barrett made a very good point, is trying to put it in your own context. Very difficult to do when you when you, when you train in Western ideology. Extremely difficult to do, right? So it's, it's still going on, still a fight now. I think we're in a little better position these days. Um, I go back when I think of this collection because when I came in, there was a lot of there was a lot of history that came with it, and Barry was a great person to mentor that history to me. Um, but also, there was a Cree elder, Walter Benes, who referred to the collection as a sacred bundle, and that has stuck in my head consistently in moving in, in my career and in looking at this exhibition. So I thought it's it's how that bundle is continuously has to be maintained, has to be carried forward, has to be activated, um, and what it contains. And it contains that that 50 years plus of history that is ours. It's our history that comes from our communities, our nations across the country. So I always think about that bundle that needs to be moved forward. I left the government, I left this uh, collection because of the limitations that I had felt placed upon me in what I could do with this collection. So when, as moving forward, I borrowed works from this collection for other exhibitions moving forward. I know what's in that collection, and, and this exhibition is about raising awareness to this collection. So I think, um, I think, and I also I came as an emerging artist at the time when 1992 was taking place, when Indigena was there, Landscape of Power, and I seen what happened in 1993, which was nothing. Artists weren't funded, indigenous people weren't trendy, the exhibitions weren't there. So that's where self-determination, sovereignty, and, and starting to create your own place within the art world was really important and what drove me moving forward. And uh, I hope that doesn't happen next year. Because we were bombarded with 150 this yeah. year. And I go back to what Janet Rogers said at her uh, book reading a few months ago in Toronto. I can't wait for the next 100 years. <laughs> so I'd like to uh, pass this on to ask Linda to give a, her la a last response in the question and close our panel for the day. I guess we're getting to that time. <laughs> um, when I started with the center, I was there's amazing stories that were shared today and you all have a sense of this amazing legacy. And for me it was uh, to continue that legacy. So, and I was only with the center for a very short time, but during that time it was great to reactivate the peer jury, the national call for the peer jury acquisitions program and to purchase more art. And then there was um, acquisitions, special acquisitions that were made to, to fill in spaces in the collection. So that's, uh, that was really important. And to really to build partnerships with other organizations to get, um, the word out on the collection and to, to get the exhibition, uh, get the work shown in more exhibitions and, and just uh, the Art Centre has always been a really uh, fantastic lender to other organizations to get these important work shown across the country and internationally. So. Yeah. <laughs> Can I say one last thing? I, I've been picking on Ryan but I have to tell you about his work. Uh, when I first saw it, uh, I have to tell you, it was really uh, quite uh, moving to find something so new, so fresh, uh, so invigorating, full of satire and wit, you know, I felt like I was looking at myself. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> especially the community where he comes from, you have to realize how important that is. Somebody with a sense of humor from kind of wonder, that was, uh, that was, uh, that was quite, quite beautiful. And, uh, you, He's his work in a lot of uh, exhibitions that I've done because they've represented But here's the dilemma. We all start off as artists, and because of the political need, yeah. we become curators, yeah. and they stop producing art. So I, when I look forward to the future, it's when we can get back to doing the work that I really believe we're intended to do. It's not explain what we do, but just do it. Right. And let somebody else try to figure it out. I have one, one last comment. And I'd re be remiss of it and say this, language. Yes. You would not believe how many young people have gone after language with a vengeance. Mm. 
And this is, when, when we could do an exhibition where all the subtitles and the catalogs are done in the language, whether it's Mishkigawak, you know, Horonoshuni and Shnabe, when that can happen, that provides a whole new accessibility to our art. But you, because you don't be pedestrian anymore, you just can't come up and look at it. You've got to take some time and you've got to know what does that mean. So language, language, language. She mm -hmm. No, not that language, no. <laughs> I want to thank Elder Sue, Sarah Diamond, Francesco, and the on-site gallery for hosting this discussion. I want to thank you all for spending your Sunday with us. And a big chimigwetch to our storytellers for sharing their stories. Our stories. And Yala Goa.